Welcome everyone to another session of the Mastermind Book Club. Tonight, in our book club, we are going over the second part of which program? Michael Saylor's program, Bitcoin, Bitcoin for, for everyone. everyone. And Bitcoin for Everyone is very powerful on different levels. Number one, as we were speaking before we started this recording, is that a lot of kids are not going to school right now. They're not going to college. They don't, they don't want to continue educating themselves. Well, we had that same test put on ourselves as a commitment. And we were asked to go in and learn this program from Michael Saylor on, on Bitcoin for everybody. And it's very powerful, but you have to dedicate time and sit down. Just trying to learn one program is, a, is immense. Can you imagine trying to learn five? And that's what kids are going through right now. This type of situation, is it because of social media? Is it because of their friends? Is it because of hearsay? Is it because of all of these reasons? Or there's not one that exceeds, excels most. They all have to do with it. There's others as well, but the reality is, is that things are changing. And that's why we're going through Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a huge change that's coming to the world slowly. And it is impacting the world much more rapidly than credit cards have in the past 60 years. It took 50 years for people to start accepting credit cards all over the world. And now here we are with crypto, Bitcoin, which has been around for about 12, 13 years. This is the second part of Bitcoin for everybody. And Gina is going to do the introduction and summary on. Go ahead, Gina. Yes, I'm going to be talking about how a pyramid scheme works, just like you see the graph on here. And um, some people were saying that, you know, they wanted to compare, say, Bitcoin to a pyramid scheme. But um, this is how you can tell the difference. It says here um, in a pyramid scheme that, that usually the company would charge a high entry fee for those who want to, to get into the pyramid scheme. They come out and they charge you, you know, a high fee uh, so that you can become a member. And the next one is that the company's uh, business model is vague. In, in other words, we don't really understand what it is that it's all about. They just tell you or come up to you with these promises. Oh, you can make a lot of money if you join us. And, you know, just, just come on, come on board. Look at all of these successful people that we have on here. You can be just like one of them, okay? Uh, they are usually overpriced, uh, have no market or consumer value. And then the third one, it says there that the legitimate companies uh, will discourage uh, a, discourage salespeople from buying too much product, okay, stock and other opportunities of refund for uh, unsold products. And they said the pyramids, the schemes do the opposite of that. And the next one is that the company will promise uh, you unusually high returns on your investment. It's like, come on, jump in. You know, uh, many of us have been introduced to these schemes before. We have friends that will come to us and say, hey, I just joined this really great group and come with me. You can make a lot of money. And they don't necessarily tell you what it's all about. And then you say, okay, because it's a friend, you start to trust them. And then, you know, perhaps you, you jump into the business with them. Okay. So they uh, promise you a high return. And uh, the money you invest, the higher your returns will be. It said the more money that you invest, the higher your return will be. So that's an idea of what a pyramid scheme is like. David? And I just wanted to add there is that those who are starting out in a pyramid scheme don't make any money while everybody else makes money on whatever it is that you do. If you bring someone in, they're, the people up at the top are making money. If you right. sell a product, you're the people at the top are making money. You think you're making money, but you're actually producing for the people above you. And that is a pyramid scheme. Bitcoin is not in this category. And that's why it's being explained in the book. It's not, Bitcoin is not a pyramid scheme. Right. How Bitcoin works. Did I just, I just skipped the page, I think. Oops, oh no, that's right. How Bitcoin works. In 20, 2009, there were zero Bitcoins. But you can see here as throughout the, the ages, throughout the years, you can see that Bitcoin will have a fixed supply of 21 million. It's at 19 million 68,000, what I saw this morning, somewhere around that, 19 million 68,000. You can verify if you'd like. 
What does this mean? That eventually there will be no more Bitcoins created. However, if you compare this to gold or any other source, you're going to notice that there's plenty that can be printed and can be supplied. And we're going to look at that in a moment after Charles gives his summary on the following. Charles? Hey, yes, good evening, everyone. Bitcoin is an innovation that is represented by a superior, uh, superior form of money, but there is no future promises beyond being in possession of a digital bearer instrument. The only utility of Bitcoin is holding it as a currency and transacting with it in a future, whether that be exchange for a legacy currency or for other goods and services. Bitcoin is only useful as a form of money and it will only maintain value if others demand it in the future. But this is true of any form of money, not just Bitcoin. Money is not a collective uh, hallucination or merely a belief of the system. Monetarily goods have distinct properties which make them more or less effective to facilitating exchange However, monetary properties are not absolute. The relatively strength of monetary properties is the fundamental basis of demand. When the market uh, evaluates Bitcoin, it does so relatively to the monetary mediums, the dollar, euro, yen, and gold, and et cetera. So in other words, Bitcoin is, is, uh, is only as popular as the demand for Bitcoin it can be used to, uh, to I guess, uh, exchange for product, products, goods, and services over a long haul. Uh, just like money, uh, it could be anything. We, we could, you know, it is a form of, uh, of trade, all right? Uh, the supply of Bitcoin and its regular supply concentrates is the foundation of Bitcoin's utility and fundamental demand demanded. It is also why Bitcoin is not a pyramid scheme. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. That is Bitcoin sellers selling point. Everyone knows that it, everyone knows it. Everyone remembers it. Everyone can verify it at any point in time, just as David did for us. For a discussion of how and why Bitcoin has credibility, fix supply. See Bitcoin not bit, uh, blockchain and Bitcoin is not uh, backed by nothing. But for now, just work on the assumption that the supply of Bitcoin is capped at 21 million. In contrast, no one knows the supply of the dollar. The feds estimate current supplies of dollars, but no one knows how many dollars will actually exist in the future. There's no constant uh, constraint on the supply of the dollar other than the Federal Reserve. And we all know for sure that many more dollars will exist in the future. It is a, a, a limitless function, a limitless function. In the end, there is fundamental demand for Bitcoin because of monetary policy. Uh, optimal engineering, credibility and force relative to the competition, Bitcoin is vastly superior uh, monetary medium. Now, what, it, what it's pretty much saying in a, in, a, in a short is that because there's so many dollars out there, we don't know how many dollars will actually show up in the future because they're just print, printing money and money and money on top of money, which is devaluating the dollar. That means that we have inflation because of the dollar not being worth, uh, being worth its optimal amount. Therefore, Bitcoin would be a suitable option because of the supply and demand and its legitimacy to actually keep track of it. We know there's only 21 million Bitcoin. Therefore, you know, it, it can hold its, its price. It can hold its weight. And just to conclude, the supply of Bitcoin and its regular supply contract, cons, contract is the fundamental uh, fund? I'm sorry, is the foundation of Bitcoin's utility and fundamental demand. It is also why Bitcoin is. It is also why Bitcoin is not a pyramid scheme. 
there are only or ever will be 21 million Bitcoin. The Bitcoin selling point, everyone knows it. Everyone remembers it. That's good. It's repeat. I, I think I read that before. <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. I got. I'll take it from here, Charles. Thanks. All right. Thank uh, you. I, I want to be clear that there are people who have said that the dollar is a pyramid scheme. Now, are they right? Are they wrong? I'm not here to talk bad about the dollar. I use the dollar every day, and I'm certain most people listening to this audio use the dollar every day. However, from this chart provided by the Fred, if you want to look at what Fred is, is Federal Reserve Bank. I mean, that's that's basically what it is, the Federal Reserve Bank. And Fred, and this is from St. Louis, these numbers, you can see that the dollar rose from back in the early 1980s, and it just went straight up, right? And the amount of, of, of dollars that, was, that were printed in St. Louis, it's just rose. And you can see here in 2008, all of a sudden it skyrocketed, boom. See how much has been printed. And then in the last several years, it's gone down a little bit, but now we're back up. In other words, we have seen inflation since 2008, year after year after year, year after year after year. And I don't know beyond that, before that, but I would say it has, it's existed at least for 20 years straight. And what they figured out is the more money they print, the more they give out, the more people will spend. Guess who makes the money? It's not the people at the bottom, the people at the top. And that's part of the reason people say that it might be a pyramid scheme because not the people at the bottom making the dollar. It's the people at the top that are making it because you've, once you get it, you've got to spend it to, in order to survive. And that's just the reality. And people don't see it that way, but the reality is most people, if they kept the money, they would ruin the system. They would stop the inflation system because everyone just wants to spend. Most people want to spend until we figure out that there is a limited supply in Bitcoin, that there will be no more in that amount. And that amount will depend on people like you and me and the hedge funds that are coming in and the whales that are coming in into Bitcoin, whether you will hold it and its value will retain itself and the demand will continue to rise from the circumstances that we are currently facing. Now, did you know that if the government came after you and you had dollars, they would take away all your assets? This happens in Zimbabwe, in Venezuela, possibly Cuba and other places. It's a reality. The government can confiscate your money in your bank accounts. It's happening in Russia with Russian, uh, what is it, what, Russian wealthy people they are being confiscated their wealth by the u.s and by europe and so on because of the war that's going on right now does that sound like a good thing no your your bitcoin could be confiscated if you don't protect it properly and that's why you need to learn the steps necessary to protect your money because if you leave your money in an exchange guess what you that money is not yours that money is, just, is the exchange You've got to place it in a wallet that is very secure and that is away from the system. And the system will always have access to your money. Today, they just released information that Bitcoin is, a com is going to be considered a commodity. And therefore, once they say commodity, you're going to have to pay taxes on it. That's it. That's the way it works. I don't know. But another thing I want to let you know, there are a lot of people using these IP addresses that are not located what they are. And they're cracking down on that little by little, trying to get in and finding out where people actually are instead of the IP addresses that are being reported. Bitcoin cannot be banned. They've tried to stop it. It's too late. When in an infancy age, they could have stopped it probably, but then they let it grow too fast because they didn't think of it too much. And soon enough, you're going to be able to purchase your, your house, your cars, your, your food through Bitcoin. People do it in Zimbabwe and Zambia and Venezuela, and, and a few other places, in Salvador, El Salvador, probably Cuba as well, uh, amongst other places. But the reality is, is that it is a monetary killer because it's not using the monetary system within the country that is there. In Zimbabwe, for example, in order to get money, you have to go in and put a bid, and it's like an auction to get dollars. I don't know the whole system, but this is part of Someone that I follow that uh, that I heard on the podcast who's recommended by Bitcoin for everybody, which is Stefan Levera. And in his podcast, I've learned so much about Bitcoin and so much about these other places that use Bitcoin as their currency because 
the government doesn't allow them to use it. Terrible, right? Now, Bitcoin, no concentration by country. I don't want to go into too much to this, but I just wanted to show you that there is a lot to know about Bitcoin. There's a lot. And you don't have to learn it all in one step. What you do is you take it step by step and learn it. Bitcoin, the act of banning Bitcoin would require, what does it require? Would require preventing open source software code from being run and preventing digital signatures created by cryptographic keys from being broadcast on the internet. It's not easy to get rid of Bitcoin. People will attempt to get rid of it. However, what, they, what we're going to see is a lot of hackers attempting to go in. And the best thing about having Bitcoin is that you need more than one source of security in order to be able to access your Bitcoins. Some people have gotten to, to their currencies through the exchange, not through your, through your wallets, because the wallets are individual and you have keys. And if you keep those safe, you don't keep them on a computer, then chances are you're going to be okay. Bitcoin for everybody. Next week, we're going to review the last section of Bitcoin for everybody. I highly recommend it. Take a look at it. And before we go, I just wanted to ask the other members, do you have anything else to say or, or can we end this session? Whoops, can't hear you, Gina, you're muted. Yeah, I like that quote there in the middle. Money is one of the greatest instrument of freedom ever invented by man. It is um, money which is which in existing society opens an astounding range of choice to the poor man, a range greater than that which how uh, not many generations ago was open to the wealthy. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought that was pretty cool that if you want to end with that, you know, given the idea that money was created, it gives us freedom. That's why we need more of it. Yes. <laughs> the more we get, the more freedom we have. Well, and so, <laughs> well, great that's invention there. Very good quote. I, I wasn't even looking at the quote. Thank you, Gina, for that. And I guess that's it, unless Charles wants to say anything else. And I think well, basically, uh, just real quick in closing, that uh, we as individuals, we need to, to look at our, our monetary system, look at, the, at what money is currently doing, uh, in contrast to Bitcoin, gold, silver, and other uh, uh, commodities and so forth that we use for exchange, and pretty much uh, really take a, a accurate um accountability of your of you know what your what your standings are so you don't be surprised by whatever may happen down the road that's it all right thank you thank you charles thank you gina and thank you for listening to our summary of the second part of michael sailor's bitcoin for everybody program and until next week we'll review the last part of this educational program take care Oops, sorry, here we go. <laughs>